So when doing a, a research study, you have to decide who you're actually going to look at. Um, as I said in the previous lecture, we'll be interested in the population of interest. Um, but in general, we can't actually study the entire population that we're interested in. And so instead, we have to look at a sample or some subsection of that population. So when researchers use these words, they use them to mean distinct things. The population is everyone that you're interested in. The sample is some subselection of that population. Now, researchers don't always construct samples. Sometimes they do actually look at the population. So for example, qualitative researchers often will define the population of interest as people who go to a particular institution or participate in it. So I myself have previously done research on schools. And in that context, I haven't constructed a sample because I was looking at a school with 500 students and I was actually able to interact with most of them. And so in that context, I was actually doing research on the population of interest. But in most cases, we can't do that. And in other research I've done and met much of the research that other people do, you have to look at a sample or a group of the population and ask how representative that is and attempt to construct a sample that seeks to, rep to represent the population overall. So, um, you know, the thing about sampling is that often um, people think like a sample isn't as good as population-based studies. But in fact, as I'll present today, sometimes samples can be better. Um, now, this may be a curious thing to, re to, to think about, but if you attempt to study an entire population, often you can miss huge swaths of that population. There may, and the, the swaths of the population that you miss, you miss for systematic reasons or for reasons that have a deep pattern to them. And when you miss groups of people because of a pattern, then you're really concerned about the findings that you might generate. Let me give you an example of this. Every 10 years in the United States, we do a census. And in that census, we gather information about people living in, um, in the US. Now that census is required to be filled out by everyone. So presumably it is a population-based study. But one of the things that we know about the census is that people don't actually all fill it out. So there are lots of people who never fill out the census. Maybe not lots, but there are many. And you know, uh, those people who don't fill out the census are patterned. That is, there are particular types of people who don't fill out the census. For example, immigrants are less likely to fill out the census. Why? Well, in some cases, they may be concerned about their immigration status and how they answer those questions could affect the immigration their, their position within the country. Now, the census so far has no effect on people's immigration status, but immigrants may feel a certain precariousness or fragility to their position in a country and thereby refuse to fill out the census. So in this sense, there are some people like immigrants that we never reach, but also censuses seek to find people in households. So people who live somewhere, you typically get mailed a census. Now think about this for a moment, like who couldn't get the census if it was mailed to them? Well, people who experience housing insecurity or who change their homes really frequently are less likely to receive the census. So if you're experiencing a position of homelessness, you're, pro you're probably not going to take the census. If you're moving with a high degree of, of frequency, perhaps because of being in an uncertain or difficult economic position, you're unlikely to take the census. And so, one of the things that we social scientists rely upon to do analysis of the American population is not the census, which is the population-based study, but instead it's something called the CPS, which is a sample-based approach to understanding the US population. And for most social scientists, we actually think the CPS is better than the census. Why? Well, because the populations that are difficult to reach we can sample upon and spend more time gathering information from them. This allows us to dedicate resources 
to try and reach those people who are unlikely to respond with population-based studies. And so samples allowing us to study a smaller group can at times provide better information than population-based studies overall or stronger based information. Now, samples allow us to study things in ways that help us connect to the broader population. Um, now, and when we do that, there are different logics that we can use. And the logics that we use, or how it is, excuse me, that we choose our sample is called a sampling frame, or what is the ways in which we choose a group of people or a set of places in order to study. And there are a variety of sampling frames. One of the primary sampling frames is random samples. Random samples are typically used in quantitative rather than qualitative research. And um, they have a very particular quality to them. So in order for a sample to be a random sample, there has to be a known non-zero probability of selection for every member in the population. I'll repeat that. There has to be a known non-zero probability of selection for every member in the population. What does this mean? Well, it means that we know the probability of selection for different groups and the probability of selection is never zero. So there's no group that it has a zero probability of selection. There are different kinds of random samples. Some random samples treat everyone the same. And so everyone has the same probability of selection. So here, the one kind of sample, which we refer to as a simple random sample, is where we give everyone the equal probability of selection. That's a pretty easy way to construct a sample, but it also has some downsides because there may be elements of the population that um, are relatively small, but also relatively important, or that you may want to know a lot about. And so in those instances, if we do a simple random sample where everyone has the same probability of selection, we may not get many members of that population. And as I said in an earlier lecture, the critical thing for gathering information is variation. We need to have multiple categories of, uh, of multiple variables and then multiple instances of each variable. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm interested in um, uh, gender and in particular, I'm interested in the experiences of transgender or gender nonconforming people. That is people who do not categorize themselves as cis hetero, which means, I mean, or cisgendered, excuse me, um, which means that they don't think of themselves as um, and identify as having the same gender that they were assigned at birth. Now, such transgender individuals are not exceptionally rare in the population, but they're not that common either. And so in order to capture the transgender population, I may want to try and construct a subsample where I oversample on that group. In other words, I create a greater probability of selection of transgender people so that I have many instances of that category for my analysis, many more than I would get under a simple random sample. Of critical importance here is that the probability of selection is known. So I can actually assign different probabilities of selection to different members of the population in order to construct what we call an oversample of some groups so that I can make claims about them. Now, with all kinds of samples that we construct, we do this. Um, often in the United States, we're interested in racial um, uh, uh, dynamics among samples that we construct. And so for certain groups like African Americans or Native Americans, we may construct an oversample, which is to say we assign a higher probability of selection for African Americans or Native Americans so that there are more people that we gather information about from those racial and ethnic groups as compared to whites. The purpose of doing this is that it allows us to make claims. 
Now, the reason that that is still a random sample is that I know the probability of selection and that no one has a zero probability of selection. Also, if you think about it for just a moment, a known non-zero probability of selection allows you to assign some things a probability of one. Like you can literally pick them within a sample as long as everything else has a non-zero probability of selection. So think for a moment, maybe not about sampling people, but ask yourself, how would you sample places? <clears throat> so I might be interested in um, something like uh, crime and the rising rates of violence within uh, the United States. Actually, just as an empirical phenomenon, let me just say that rates of violence have been declining in the US really dramatically for um, several decades now, two decades now. And so, um, but I might be interested recently, so in this moment right now that I'm speaking to you, um, which is July, 2020, um, uh, there's been a slight uptick in violence in the United States, and I might be interested in why that's happening. And as I do that, I might think, you know, Chicago is a really important city to study this, in part because this is happening a lot in Chicago, but also because there's lots of other studies that we've done of Chicago and relative to gun violence in Chicago. And so I'd like to be able to speak to that with my sample. So as I am going about picking places to study with the increase in gun violence, one of the things that I might do is assign Chicago a probability of one of selection. That is, I actually pick Chicago as a city that I'm going to study. I am allowed to do this insofar as I know that the probability of selection for Chicago is one, and that all the other cities or places that are defined within my population of interest have a probability of selection that is above zero. Finally, as we construct these samples, we begin to sort of see the ways in which to construct a representative sample of the population doesn't just mean that our sample perfectly represents the population, it's that we know how it represents the population. So again, the reason we often go beyond doing a simple random sample where everybody has the same probability of selection is to deal with a range of phenomenon that are important to us as researchers. Constructing a random sample then requires a considerable amount of knowledge about the population of interest to begin with. And as we pull and draw more and more samples in the ways in which, in, in order to answer critical questions of importance to us, we're able to refine again and again our sampling techniques in order to more accurately make claims about the population. Now, generalizability or the capacity for us to say that our sample speaks to the population of interest is intimately intertwined with gathering a random sample. Or put differently, in order to claim that your sample represents the population of interest, it has to be a random sample. It has to be a sample where every member of that population of interest has a known non-zero probability of selection. Now, uh, not all samples are random samples. Um, sometimes random samples are relatively under, uh, uh, unrealistic. And so um, uh, qualitative research is an example of non-random samples where there is not a non-zero probability of selection for most members. In fact, there is an absolute selection of one particular group. Strictly speaking, non-random samples do not have generalizability or they cannot be generalized beyond the population under study. So in the ways in which I have done some of my qualitative research, for example, in studying a school, um, that study is not generalizable beyond the particular instances of, of observations that I made. Um, but often such 
random selection is not possible, particularly within qualitative research or realistic. So, you know, let's take an example. The sociologist Mitch Denier um, wrote a book in uh, 1999 called Sidewalk. And in it, he was interested in the street life of New York. He was interested in the ways in which New Yorkers navigated sort of their everyday neighborhoods. And in particular, he was interested in people who were unhoused or who experienced bouts of homelessness and what it was that they did in the neighborhoods that they spent time in. Now, one way to think about homeless people would be that they're an indication of a social problem. That is, what they are is um, uh, uh, something that creates problems for and represents problems of neighborhoods. But another way to think about them, and one of the things that Denier argued, was that these um, unhoused people or people who are experiencing bouts of homelessness were actually critical actors in the neighborhood. They were people who participated in community life, sometimes in negative ways and sometimes in positive ways. <clears throat> but they saw what was happening on the street all the time and served as crucial members of the sociality of the neighborhoods. Now, in order to study um, these kinds of men in New York City, Denier did not construct a random sample of men who experienced homelessness in New York. One of the reasons why is because this would be nearly impossible. That is, how would you know how to select randomly people who experience bouts of homelessness or who are unhoused for some period of time, or in Denier's case, who are street vendors? There's no actual record of these people. And so you couldn't really possibly construct a random sample of it. It would have been impossible to come up with a list of all neighborhoods in the US that have a homeless population, and even if you could, you probably don't have the resources to pick up and move from place to place to see this phenomenon. You couldn't do this in New York City. You also couldn't do it across the US. And so instead, what he did was simply select a particular neighborhood, describe what happened within that neighborhood, and try to extend his insights more generally to other cases. The downsides of such non-random samples is that they are not likely to reflect the overall population. And so we have to be careful about the claims that we make from them in terms of their overall generalizability. Non-random samples are sometimes referred to as convenience samples because convenience samples are samples that we draw that are convenient to us. Um, I happen to live in New York City. And so if I'm going to do a study of uh, life in the United States, I may focus on the experiences of New York for reasons of convenience. I have an apartment here and it's easy for me to walk out my door and do a study. We might also do snowball sampling. Snowball sampling is a sampling technique where we identify one person within a category of interest to us and then we ask that person to refer us to other people who sit, fit, excuse me, within a similar category. Snowball sampling is often done during interview research. And there are good cases, good examples of why snowball sampling might be essential. In some of my own research, I write on elites or on wealthy people. Wealthy people, as you might imagine, are not the easiest to access. Um, there, I mean, there are some lists of wealthy people that, um, those who are trying to fundraise and gather information, maybe the politicians or cultural institutions have, but overall it's pretty hard to get access to them. And more importantly, if you just contact a wealthy person and say, hi, I'd like to interview you, it's pretty unlikely that they're gonna say, sure, why don't you interview me? So instead, one of the things that we do with the kind of work that I do is to develop a relationship with one or two wealthy people. To, to instill in them a sense of trust in your ethical orientation as a researcher, and then to ask that person to recommend other people to you. Now, the reason that you do this is that people are more likely to respond to researchers if they know that their friends have interacted with them and trust them. So a snowball sample, you should think of as this imagery where you start with something pretty small, and then as you 
you sort of let it, imagine a snowball rolling down a hill. What happens as a snowball rolls down a hill? It picks up more and more snow and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now the problems with snowball sampling is obvious, which is that you end up existing within a small set of peer networks that are not generalizable to the, to the population. But they at times may be a necessity. That is, it may be necessary to gather information in a non-random way using snowball methods in order to be able to speak to people who are of interest to you. In the, in the case that I'm speaking about, it's incredibly hard to get access to rich people. Rich people may be a little skeptical of researchers who approach them. And so one of the things that we do as researchers is to draw upon um, a single person and then ask them to, re to recommend subsequent people for us. Now, when we construct samples, one of the concerns that we have is a non-response bias. What's non-response bias? Well, non-response bias is, are the systematic patterns of those who do and do not respond to our inquiry. So response bias and non-response bias have a variety of reasons. Enthusiasm is one of them. People who are passionate about a topic may be more likely to participate. So if I'm deeply interested in the sets of questions that a researcher is asking about, I may be more likely to participate. But this introduces bias to my sample because people who are interested in my topic are more likely to participate in my research. If I'm asking questions about gender, for example, that may be people who are interested in gender relations who agree to participate, and that biases the kinds of results that I have. So people who are extremely engaged in politics, for example, often have more extreme positions on either the left or the right than the overall population. And so people who are extremely interested in politics may be more likely to respond to a political survey, but insofar as they do, they may be likely to bias our results in one direction or another. Sometimes comfort is a reason why people participate. So if a topic is controversial or something that people usually consider private, people who are more comfortable with it may be more likely to reply. My recent research has been on sex, sexuality, and sexual assault. And as you might imagine, people have different degrees of comfort speaking about these things. Some people are more likely to reply than others. And those people may well be different than the general population. Another reason for non-response bias is the method of data collection. So, Technology isn't equally distributed across a population. Um, not everyone in the world has smartphones. Not everyone in the United States has smartphones. And so if I want to gather information that requires people to respond to my survey using a smartphone or a device um, uh, that has access to the internet, I may miss certain people. Similarly, for a long time, one of the main ways in which we did surveys was through random digit dialing. Random digit dialing was a way to access people, and it was a way to access people that required them primarily to have a home phone number. But over the last 15 years, fewer and fewer people have home phone numbers. And this means that if I use that method, I'm less likely to access some people. And the people I'm less likely to act, access are more likely to be younger. So this concern with non-response bias or the ways in which the respondents to my inquiry are biased in particular directions means that sometimes, even when I do a perfect job in constructing a sampling frame, my sample itself may still not be representative because some people are choosing not to reply for patterned reasons. Now, occasionally people look at the response rate, that is how many people or what percentage of people responded in order to capture non-response bias. That's an okay indicator, but it's not perfect. And I would say to you, you should think less about what the rate of response is 
and more about whether or not the population of the sample is fully representative of the general population. So response rates have gone down overall with samples, particularly as people and populations experience sampling fatigue. And a low response rate doesn't necessarily mean that there's non-response bias, just as a high response rate doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't non-response bias. Instead, what we need to think about is, are there systematic reasons, patterned reasons why people are choosing not to reply? And if there are, what can we do to try and alleviate that? Okay, now that we have a sense of um, sampling, I want us to finish with a discussion of um, correlation and causation, and in particular, questions of validity within our research. Correlation is the idea that two or more variables are related to one another in some way. Causation is an instance of correlation where one variable actually affects or causes the change in another variable. All instances of causation are subsumed under the category of correlation, but not all correlations are causes. You probably have heard this before, or maybe you've heard this before. Correlation doesn't equal causation. Correlation doesn't equal causation. It's very hard to establish causality to understand whether or not a particular variable causes one um, uh, an outcome in another variable. But there are ways in which we can begin to examine the potential for causality. And I want us to think about three things. The first is the timing of the variable. The second is the directionality of the relationship. And the third, and from my perspective, the most important is considering spuriousness. Many correlations that exist aren't causal. There might be a connection between two things, but one doesn't necessarily cause the other. One of the ways in which we try to establish causation within a correlation is to look at timing. So in social sciences, time is your friend when it comes to making arguments about causality. What do I mean by this? Well, in order for one variable to cause another, it has to precede that variable in time. That is, it has to have happened before the other variable. An example of this is education and earnings. So one of the things that we observe is that there's a relationship or a correlation between education and earnings. People who have higher degrees of education also have higher earnings. Now, what we know about this correlation can partially be turned into, potentially, a cause, because we also know that people's education happens before their earnings. That is, people go to school and then they get jobs. And the timing or the sequencing of the variables allows us to begin to suggest a causal directionality to this phenomenon. Now, that directionality can sometimes be in question. And often our own intuitions about the directionality of relationships is wrong. So let me give you a common example of this, or maybe not a common example, but an interesting example of this. We know from doing a range of studies that there is a relationship between the amount of time that fathers spend with children, particularly in divorced relationships, and the health of those children. So the correlation here is between two factors, the amount of time that divorced fathers spend with children and the overall health of those children. If you think about this for a moment, one of the implications that some researchers might claim is when fathers spend time with children, children are healthier. In other words, we presume a directionality to the relationship. Fathers spending time with kids improves their health. But one of the things we should always question within a correlational finding is, is the directionality correct? So some researchers have evaluated this and noted something interesting, which is that the directionality of our assumption might be wrong. 
it might not be the case that divorced fathers spending time with their kids leads to their kids being healthier. It could be the case that healthy children have fathers who spend more time with them. In this sense, the directionality might be in question to some of our findings, where intuitively we would say, well, obviously when fathers spend more time with their kids, the kids are better off. It might not be so obvious. It might be the case that children who have better health are more likely to have fathers who want to spend time with them. Now, the actual answer here to this question from my reading of the literature, which I'm not a total expert in this area, is kind of in question. And one of the things that we have to do is help figure out what's the true directionality of this relationship. Finally, we also need to think about spuriousness. This really deserves its own slide because it's such an important phenomenon. Spuriousness is when a relationship appears causal, but it isn't. Because there's some outside variable, some external variable that is driving both what we think of as the cause and what we're seeing as the effect. Spurious relationships are incredibly common within the social sciences. Often, what appears to be a relationship between variables turns out to actually be caused by some other variable we hadn't thought of. So I'm going to give you two examples of this. There is a correlation between listening to classical music at home and success in school. And so some people have argued that listening to classical music causes success. Now, this to some people makes a lot of sense. They're like, well, classical music is sophisticated and it has all these qualities to it that make it likely to um, be related to school success. We'll talk about that in our culture's lectures. But, you know, and, and actually public officials got very excited about this finding. They wanted to look for a way to improve success in school. And some officials even decided to buy classical music CDs for all the children in a school district. But this finding turned out to be spuriousness. So I'm going to ask you, think about it for a moment. What else could explain both listening to classical music and doing well in school? What could an alternate variable be that explains both of these phenomena so that the correlation that we observe is not really causal at all, but instead explained by a different variable? Well, the thing that researchers have found, and maybe some of you thought of it about it, was that listening to classical music at home is highly related to being wealthy. Wealthier families are more likely to listen to classical music. And wealthier families are more likely to have children who are successful in school. There's a lot of reasons for this. Their parents tend to be more educated and can help in school. Their parents have more resources and can dedicate them to the children. The consequence of this is that giving low-income families classical music to listen to doesn't suddenly change their test scores. You would need to actually give the children wealth or families wealth, not their music collection, to see the difference. Wealth here is the spurious variable within the relationship between classical music and school performance. Another example here, to return to one of my earlier um, uh, uh, discussions, is the relationship between income and earnings. There is another spurious relationship here. Now, um, I mean, sorry, not the income and earnings, the relationship between education and earnings. So when I said that there's a clear relationship and a temporal relationship between education and earnings, I didn't consider a potential spurious relationship. So what else might explain both your level of education and your earnings? Well, here it's gonna be the same thing as classical music. Having wealthy parents may explain part of your level of education. It also may explain part of your learnings, earnings. So some of the relationship between education and earnings 
could be explained by family background, in particular, the amount of wealth that your family has. So at least some of the effect of education on earnings has nothing to do with education. And what it has to do with is wealth, familial wealth, and how wealthy families are more likely to have children who complete school at high rates and more likely to have children who earn more money. Now, the relationship between education and earnings still exists, but part of what we observe in the correlation is spurious. In other words, part of it is explained by some other thing. Two final concepts. The first is validity. And here, um, we return to our discussion from the last lecture of a series of assumptions of operationalization. For our product to be valid, it has to measure what we think it's measuring. Sometimes even carefully collected data turns out not to accurately measure our intended topic. So when in the previous example, we were trying to measure aggression, we might ask about the validity of the measurement assumption that we had, whether or not we are really measuring the concept that we're interested in. Two things can affect this. The first, I mean, more than two things can actually, but I'm just gonna talk about two today. One is social desirability bias. Subjects give an answer they think is socially acceptable or what they think the researcher wants to hear. This is common for controversial subjects or more common for controversial subjects. It can also be a problem based on the researcher's characteristics. For example, men might answer questions about dating differently to a female researcher than to a male researcher. Or we may want to impress other people. If answering in front of other people, men may inflate the number of sexual partners that they've had, while women may want to reduce them. There is social desirability in the ways in which people interact because research is a social experience. It is not just an abstract or objective data gathering experience. And so we need to take steps to try and reduce this kind of bias. Ideally, surveys should be answered anonymously, and it's also important to be careful about wording. Don't uh, use statements that are leading, like, do you, agree that most Amer do, do you agree with most Americans that? Because suddenly you're introducing social desirability. Like, do I agree with most people? Am I like most Americans? Well, some people are gonna say absolutely, and other people are gonna say absolutely not, not because of the question, but because of the way in which you worded it you might want to also ask people to respond alone so that they aren't influenced by the presence of others. We also can have the problem of poor measures about whether or not the thing that we operationalize is a good measure. Both of these address validity. Reliability means that measures themselves are consistent. In theory, another researcher could redo your study and get similar responses. So this means that subjects interpret questions in similar ways, that when one subject interprets the question, they interpret it relative to the concept that you're trying to operationalize, and that all other subjects do the same thing. It also means that questions are asked in a consistent way. If I'm doing interviews with people, I may want to make sure that my interviews consistently ask questions in patterned ways where the ask, people get asked the same thing. I don't ask it one way to one person and another way to another. So I don't say to one person, how much money do you make? And another person, I say, um, what was your paycheck last week? And to another person, I say, um, uh, um, how much money did you um, do you think that you'd like to make? These are different questions. What I need to do is ask questions consistently. So we need to make sure that we ask um, questions in the same way and that our tone even in asking questions um, is the same. We need to make sure to test questions first to be sure that people are interpreting them in a, quest in a consistent way. Often when we do studies, we do pretests or we, we kind of evaluate our instruments before we actually gather data to make sure that the responses that we're getting are reliable or in other words, that the measures are consistent across every single subject.
people may give answers that have nothing to do with the topic because they misunderstand the question. And so testing a survey or a questionnaire or a way of interacting before actually giving it to the entire sample or population of interest is absolutely important. So this should give you some sense of how it is that researchers begin to undertake their methods. There's so much more to be done um, with an understanding of each one of these things. But for now, I hope that you have a rich understanding of the methodology that social scientists use because through the next set of lectures, I'm gonna be talking about a lot of studies and I want you to have a good groundwork for making sense of some of the advantages and disadvantages to the approaches that scholars take, as well as the capacity to evaluate some of the information that I'm providing.